Broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne, this is Wilms Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. Dougal Cameron, he operates Carnage House Productions with his older brother Alexander, who has written articles for The Unshackled, and his younger brother Andy. Uh, Dougal is the most prominent face uh, in the family, conducting the one-on-one -on -one in video interviews that are published on their YouTube channel, and the brothers also produce their weekly podcast called The, the Rap, which is a summary of the news of the week, which you can uh, view on SoundCloud and iTunes. It's certainly on, on my uh, weekly must listen to uh, podcasts. Uh, so I would certainly advise you to make sure you subscribe. Now, Carnage House has been going for around a year and many of us have noticed their rise in recent months. So they've been a great addition to their local alt media community. So I'll just bring Dougal on now. Dougal, are you there? I'm here, thanks for having me. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I'll just, see, I'll just see if this transition worked. Oh, I no. thought the um, silent but deadly to the planet joke was brilliant, if, uh, uh, if I may say. Yes, there's a time and a place for fart jokes. Okay, there's the ugly mug. Yeah, I've got you on the screen. So thank you for, for joining me tonight, Dougal. As I said, it's, been, it's great that we're finally having an on-air chat. And mm. yeah, you were just on Dear Beltran's live stream uh, Wednesday evening, which... Uh, I think a lot of people thought was just a flirt piece because she was very sort of giggly schoolgirl uh, over you. I promise I'm not going to do that to you tonight. Don't, don't, I don't blame her. But I am going to start off by, by talking about uh, one of your physical characteristics and that's uh, you're a ginger. Uh, people who are watching this will be able to uh, see that, but you're the only ginger in your family, which means that you, you've, there's a ginger gene in your family and it's manifested in you so i just want to ask have you like have you done sort of like a family tree to find out where the ginger gene originated no i haven't one of my uncles has has got it but we also don't know where where he got it from um my my conclusion is that the uh the ginger gene is actually powerful and it uh it, it blesses some lucky ones of us i'll give uh, a quick little shout out as well to my lovely girlfriend dia um she loves the uh, she loves a shout out. So, well, That's she all was I with say. yeah. She was with uh, Morgan Munro, our senior producer today, uh, just at church. Oh. Uh, that's another one of her boyfriends. So. Making me jealous. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a Melbourne boyfriend. Okay, I'll she's be. Got, yeah, I'll keep the fort down in Sydney. Mm, she's got a lot of boyfriends. No problem with that. Now. <laughs> Obviously, you're you're a proud uh, ginger, but obviously there's been a lot of stigmatization and prejudice against gingers over the years. Obviously, uh, the terms carrot top, uh, ranger, uh, daywalker. That, yes, day daywalker. There, there's there's another one. Uh, red hair, no friends. Have I have I, have I, have I left any out? Um, no, you, I'm going to report you for offending me, though. I think I uh, put you before the Human Rights Commission. Well, I think it's because of this marginalization of gingers that they have been attracted to extremism because uh, there was a lot of attention a number of years back to a, a ginger jihadi, uh, an Australian one. I have seen one. some of them around. Yes, yes. And it actually it made journalists investigate and there were a lot of uh, ginger jihadis. But I've also noticed that the on the far right or the extreme far right, there actually are a lot of gingers there as well. There's, um, there's a few of them. Uh, in the chat here. So it, it seems definitely that, yeah, gingers, they are easy, easily susceptible to radicalization. The outsiders. Um, <laughs> yes. Well, well, it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, it takes, uh, it takes a certain type of power to make it through the, uh, the annual kick a ginger day every year without, without feeling some type of, uh, emotional pain. Um, but no, it was all, I never really cared about. It was, it was all fun. Um, and you know what? Sometimes when you can turn your weakness weakness into a strength, you just grow out your hair long and then, um, well, you, you know, some Australians 
Uh, well, who who would you say, Matt, where gingers has kind of a, a stigma or it's funny jokes? It's like Australia or maybe like Western countries, maybe, right? But you go to like China and you meet like Chinese people, you meet African people, like they think ginger hair is the best. Uh, so you get the reverse, the reverse of that in different countries, actually. I just remembered one more uh, ginger insult that I left off, Fanta pants. Or Fanta pants. Mm. I haven't heard that one before. Original. Yes, but you know what that means. Oh, okay. Do the carpet smash the drapes is the question. Mm, yes. <laughs> you don't have to answer that. Well, that's for uh, for me to know. And any anyway, that's it. that's all I'll say on that. I'll get in trouble if I say silly things on the air. Yes. Oh, well, that's why I thought I'd start off with something light. Mm -hmm. mm, good, good option, I think. Mm. But there has been, obviously, a ginger pride uh, movement now. Like, there, uh, there, there has been, like, ginger parades and i think there actually is a bit like of like there's now like ginger models like there's been a real sort of i guess surge to sort of ba basically uh you know i wouldn't say legitimize to make it, to make, yeah. make it cool yeah make it cool yeah i who cares who cares man <laughs> um like i think um yeah i've like, I wish I could say something on that, but I just have no reaction to that at all. But you are a proud ginger. I'm a proud ginger. I'm a mm. proud ginger. Mm. All right, on to, uh, on to Carnage House uh, Productions. We've got sort of the silly... That's, uh, that's the silliest I'll be tonight. Okay. Well, mm. look, we, we, I don't mind a bit of silliness. That's uh, what makes us different here in the, the alt media, that uh, we have the, the freedom to obviously talk about serious issues, but also lighten it up because uh, people want yeah. a bit of both. 100%. I yeah. like it. Now, I had watched a bit of Carnage House Productions before I made uh, contact uh, with you, and... Like, obviously, it's very well produced, the interviews uh, uh, that you and your brothers uh, do, but I was uh, suspicious of you uh, during the beginning just because I've seen a lot of alt media. Ginger. No, we've moved on from that now. <laughs> because I've seen a lot of, over my time with the Unshackled, seen a lot of alt media people rise and, and fall, and obviously, it takes... It takes a certain type of, not just commitment, but also you have to make sure that uh, you're catering to the alt media market. And what I mean by that is that you have to be red peeled enough to, to basically attract the people who don't want to watch the mainstream media because it's called the alt media because it's to offer an alternative to the mainstream media, things you can't say on the the mainstream media and when i heard you and your brothers talk about uh the deep state that's one of your sort of favorite uh, alex jones always talks about the globalist you and your brothers is sort of the deep state sorry that's my impersonation it is the deep state it's fucking deep state and obviously uh you shared all of our skepticism and most skeptical people a uh, view of the epstein suicide that there was mm. uh, something more to that mm. yeah it was it was very strange i mean i remember i was on i was on holidays in china with one of my buddies and i said i said to him look if epstein makes it to the trial we're going to see some like s s something's going to happen right something is going to happen and this is a guy who's not really even into politics. And then his red pill, red pilling was uh, when he came back and found out he, he suicided while in 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 the, the supermax in the same cell they held El Chapo in. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm, I'm skeptical. I I I don't know about where what what the actual final like with the autopsy and stuff. I'm still kind of undecided. But um, Alex, my older brother, was was writing a lot of. Um, he wrote a lot about Epstein. He wrote he wrote a really nice kind of summation of the Epstein uh, thing in some of the articles he did. I think it appeared on the Unshackled. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, we're we're very skeptical of the kind of the Clintons, the uh, the deep state, George George Soros, and it's kind of part joke, part serious. But we like to blame basically every wrong thing that happens in the world on the deep state, and you know it could be true. Yes. Uh as I said, I've, I've republished Alex's articles, and I pretty much agree with with all of them. Uh, they're, they're always uh, spot on. He's he does appear on camera, but 
you mm. you guys don't like to do sort of Skype things, and so Alex's main way of contributing mm. has been uh, writing articles, and but they've all been great. Yeah, well, our one of our issues is that um, we're actually pretty technologically illiterate. Like, we don't really have a lot of idea what we're doing. That's, I think, our, our catchphrase on our Instagram is we have no idea what we're doing. And our, um, we, it's very, because he's in China, right? And China blocks, like, uh, a lot of different social media. So it's actually very difficult for us to do any video. Um, but I would like to, to do that at some point. He's going to be back in a couple of weeks as well. Uh, so he'll be he'll be on camera a lot more. Uh, we'll do more stuff together, um, but uh, but yeah, yeah. I'm going to have him on the show as well, and I think you already know cool. probably what I'm going to spend half the show talking about. Oh, Epstein's and the Clintons and the a, cer a certain photo from 23 years oh, ago. Oh yeah, yeah. Safe in the arms of a superpower. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll yeah. save that for another time. Save now that that's going to out us. Oh, well, it shows your survivors. Yeah. We get up. We get up. Now, you're 21, and yeah. you're, the, you're the middle child, so you're, yes. you, you'd say Gen Z, uh, you, you three are. Yeah, I get mixed up with those things, but yeah, I think Gen Z is correct, I think. Now, you say you're technologically illiterate. I know what... I get what you mean in terms of broadcasting and things like that. I was at, when I st first started the Unshackled, I didn't even like I, I was. I had to learn WordPress, then learn podcasting, video production. It yeah. was all it was all a learning curve. But that's that's what you got to do. Like you got to jump in the deep end, and mm -hmm. no, base basically, if you do that first like episode, no matter how bad it is, like it's there and you've got something to work with. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, we filmed ours. Uh, we recorded the audio on one laptop and filmed the video with a second laptop, and we put it up on the on the end of a table, um, and then we just kind of superimposed the two. But I think as well, like, I think audio is more important than video. But at the end of the day, it's the content is is much more important than either of them. And if you've actually got stuff that's that kind of interesting to watch, people are happy to put up with um, kind of subpar uh, production. Yeah, definitely. It's that obviously you need decent uh, production values, but yeah, it's the the content and what I was talking about. If you're entering the the alt media, if you've got to uh, offer something that mainstream media isn't willing to do. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, one of the um, I, I mean, you you and your listeners would all be familiar about the uh, the deficits of the mainstream media. One of one of my things I really uh, well, I mean, like, I'm 21, right? I know a lot of, well, I know some things that the mainstream media won't tell you, but overall, I don't know that much at all. And this is kind of like a, a journey almost of learning. Like, I, a big reason why I, I make this, my brothers make it, is actually so we can try and work things out and learn things. Because there's a lot of things to learn and um, and we're, we're all really young. But the main, one of the problems I have with the mainstream media is you get j journalists, and one of the things with, uh, with journalists is that they're not actually trained in anything except journalism usually right they'll they'll report about economics and politics and and different things but they usually don't have a political or, or economics background um and maybe that that's doing a disservice to some who have really gone and studied it in their own time but you get these you get people who who don't know the subject matter of what they're talking about but who pretend to know everything and i think when you pretend to know everything it can be really dangerous because it's because the mainstream media can be very believable and um and it gets this rebound effect where one journalist writes something over here and that gets reproduced in a different uh mainstream media outlet over here and all of a sudden it's become reproduced so many times that it's just taken as truth but in fact n not many of the people who actually uh disseminated it actually know about the subject matter to begin with i know that uh, critics say that people like us are talking heads but we are truth seekers like we don't we don't we have an opinion but mm. we don't claim to know everything and so that's why i know that if there's a a subject area that you know i'm interested in i i want to learn more and form a view on it i do seek the opinion of experts sometimes i interview them on the show so other times they're I, it's just people i consult with just uh, uh privately but yeah that, absolutely that skepticism that is what is missing from the the mainstream media mm. and sometimes uh, ske uh skepticism leads to 
when you're like seeking out the truth, it can be unpleasant at times. Like it can lead you to some unpleasant conclusions. Uh, yeah, you conclusions. can scare the daylights out of yourself. Or it's it's things that other people don't want to hear. Mm. Yeah, and um, yeah, I, I fully agree with you there. And it's, um, I mean, it, it it can be it can be kind of difficult because sometimes you. Uh, a lot of it is because you can be very emotionally attached to ideas like that's just a, quite a natural thing um and uh when you're confronted with with things that don't quite align with your your kind of uh, elite your worldview it's it's very difficult to integrate and very easy to to kind of cast away or ex explain away or, or or cast a character assault at the person who presents it to you but um i do like that a lot about uh, about the mainstream media uh, sorry about the uh getting lost getting lost in in, in my brain but, oh um, but, did you let something slip there oh uh, not quite i'm i'm <laughs> trying to be pretty open but um I, i'm just being some facetious things i'm dealing with there are some things i'm dealing with um mm -hmm. but no i love when uh, i love when you can when you can learn things that that the media does like the truth is i shouldn't be and you might think this as well like i i shouldn't be popular at all on on youtube like this like if the mainstream media was was doing a good job there would be no room for any of us right um and and that would but that it's kind of good and bad in that way that the mainstream media is failing that creates an opportunity for for other people to provide their uh, opinions with that have different aspects of uh, truth and diff different facts and stuff like that in the same way that we're like the big social media platforms are failing like youtube and facebook and instagram and restricting content it's created a beautiful opportunity for for other social media platforms and i've got kind of big hopes for like think spot for instance from from jordan peterson that he might be able to fill that gap um but either way i think i think a lot of times the failings creates an, an opportunity so i'm uh, yeah so that's what i think you mentioned think spot so you're a bit of a lobster fan oh can i tell you if um Paul Murray's a, a fanboy of, of Donald Trump. I'm a pretty big fanboy of uh, JP. He's gone into to rehab for, uh, uh, because yes, of an addiction to a heavy prescription medication. And uh, uh, Jordan Peterson, he's... My opinion is I've never really got what's the big deal about him. I went to his show, not this year, uh, but last mm. year. He's never really somebody who's appealed to me, offered something new. I don't really like uh, self-help uh, gurus. Our, uh, one of our alt media friends, James Fox Higgins, over at the Rational Rise, he hosts. Uh, he hosted a a, a show, uh, uh, Vox Day versus uh, Jordan Peterson, Jordan Jordan X, because Vox Day wrote a book, Jordan X, uh, basically saying that Jordan Peterson is a fraud and went through mm. the 12, 12 rules for life, basically uh, debunking them. Mm. Okay. Well, I'd love to, I'd love to read it. Um, I think Jordan is um, incredibly, uh, I think that his content is, is incredibly good. I really enjoy it personally. And uh, I, I find it improves, I find it improves my life genuinely. When I listen to his stuff, I, I, I come away with valuable things. James is actually in the chat at the moment, so he's he's hearing hey, this, and so maybe you 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 two can have a. Well, I don't have I, I don't have access to the live chat, so maybe I do. I just don't know how to get it. So if there's something interesting, then feel free to to let me know, because I'm not seeing it. I I probably should have said for you to get it on uh, before, but because yeah, live chat's half the fun. D is in mm. there basically. Uh, doing her best to to basically pump pump you up. That's nice. That's what a supportive girlfriend should do. Mm. But focusing on the the mainstream media and like the yeah. the, the elites and the establishment and the the activists they they hate new News Corp and Sky News. They consider that the the, the far right outlet spreading misinformation. And but they sky after dark, <sighs> Nazis, all of them. <laughs> What, uh, when Epstein committed suicide, I was watching Paul Murray live, and he had Nick Cater on from the Menzies Research Centre and Jared Blay, who's a shadow Queensland LNP uh, state minister, and they basically said uh, about Epstein, oh, I'm sure there's a plausible explanation, you know, you always go for the stuff up over the conspiracy, except that 
with Epstein's suicide, everything stuffed up. It wasn't just one stuff up. It was basically everything that could go wrong. I, go I wrong. tell you what, I'd be interested to hear what you think about this. I mean, when we talk about the deep state, it's it's obviously very powerful. There's very powerful people in there. You look at like key figures like Soros and Clinton, obviously very high intelligent people, high IQs, whatever. But it's like, you look at some of the, the, the fuck ups they have, like the Clinton's email scandal, like the guy just not deleting the emails when Clinton told told him to twice. Um, and and then you look at the uh, how poorly the whole Epstein thing was. I mean, uh, part it leads you to believe partly that there's a lot more stuff going on which we don't know about, which seems intuitively true. But it also leads me to think that a lot of these people aren't actually as smart as we think they are. They might be terribly dumb in, in the way they handle some of these some of these incidents. Like it gives me hope that they can be defeated just because they seem so inept at at doing the uh, evil supervillain stuff. Well, if you look at uh, the history of uh, Epstein's crimes, uh, obviously he took that uh, very generous plea deal in 2008 where he only pled guilty to, to prostitution, not uh, child sex tra trafficking. And mm. it, I don't know, everyone's saying, how can you do a, a plea deal where you agree, they agree not to prosecute your co-conspirators isn't a plea deal isn't it supposed to work that you sign a plea deal to give up your co-conspirators that's normally how it's how it's supposed to work yeah well i mean the uh i, I would have loved to been like a, a fly on the wall in there because there's the, you just it's very hard to know what happened except you know it's just an absolute uh swamp of of bad things um and important people doing doing all types of silly business and the FBI is involved and it's um it's it's almost the greatest case for libertarianism is is this deep state thing um and and how these important people are, are using uh you know government force through like FBI and CIA and stuff to just do monkey business well going back to the original plea deal uh, as I said it was made in 2008 and Going back to, to 2008, you were, what, 10 years old then, so... You know. Yeah, 10, maybe yeah. 11. But you know, I was a an adult uh, then, and so I remember the, the times, and this was when, mm. like, there was MySpace, but, you know, Facebook uh, was just starting out, uh, Twitter uh, wasn't, a, wasn't a big thing, obviously YouTube was around, but basically back in 2008, the mainstream media were still the, the gatekeepers, so if... Uh, CNN, NBC, CBS, uh, ABC uh, decided that uh, this uh, pedophile billionaire taking this very generous plea deal, which basically saw him uh, have part-time detention, wasn't a big deal, then the public uh, were, were none the wiser. And over the, the 10 years since that obviously the internet has grown those those wicked uh, websites such as 4chan have uh, been created where people have discussed uh explored uh, epstein's crimes and so it's it's basically been building up this outrage over uh, that this pedophile billionaire was able to get away with that and of course it culminated with well epstein was arrested because uh mike cernovich who's an old media personality was able to get uh, court documents unsealed and of course uh there was the the, the Mi miami uh herald uh, uh journalist her name's escaped me but obviously miami herald is an actual newspaper one of the the last ones there so he had I call it one rogue uh, newspaper, uh, Julie Brown, that's it. Uh, one rogue newspaper basically doing what the entire US mainstream media wasn't willing to do. Yeah, no, big, big props to, to them. I think it, it requires a lot of balls, big balls to, um, to, to do something like that, knowing that, um, you know, you might be on the, uh, on the list to get uh, suicided. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, 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 I don't have much to say on it just because I feel like it's um, like it's just bad. There's just not much you can take away from it other than there's big time players doing dirty things and using instruments of government power to 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 cover it up. Um, so yeah, I mean, I was I was reminded of the um, 
Uh, I saw a post from James O'Keefe the other day. I think it was some anniversary of the uh, the Acorn scandal where he was only like I think he he was he was young. He was like twenty one or something. Yeah, yeah, that was like the a... thing that uh, that made him uh, James yeah. O'Keefe, and yeah. it was the beginning of sort of because in two thousand and eight Obama got the endorsement of all of the the mainstream media, and then two thousand and nine was uh, the beginning of the the fight back against the the Obama agenda which conservatives they didn't go out on the street and write and say not my president they actually scrutinized obama's government and exposed you know this guy's a bit of a fraud not pa practicing what he preaches uh you know letting a lot of uh corruption and dodgy practices go yeah and i mean it just took um you know, I think it was, he was like 21 at the time. He just had a, a little bit of money. He bought this like fur jacket, pretended to be a pimp. And his friend, oh, I should remember his friend's name. It's, it's, but um, she went out and pretended to be the, uh, to be the hooker. And they just brought down an entire government organization. I mean, I think it was uni uniformly, uniformly, I don't know what I'm saying. I think it was, I think every member of the Congress voted to shut down ACORN um, after the videos came out. And that was, that was, I was reading Breitbart's book as well. Breitbart was uh, instrument that kicked off, I think, Breitbart website as well, that, that story. Hmm. And remember uh, how Andrew Breitbart died? No, I don't, I don't remember exactly. Was it suspicious? Well, yes, it was just about when he was about to break a big story on the Clintons. Oh, right. Hmm. Um, well, I'm sure that'll, uh, I'll go and research that afterwards because that, it's not surprising, but it's it's disappointing. Now, you and your brothers, as I mentioned, were Gen Z, and I was sure to make the point. It's it's good that like, the three of you are doing this project together. That like uh, there's brotherly love, uh, uh, to use the phrase. Like obviously, because we're at a time when sort of families are disintegrating, and they're, 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 there's a lot of uh, attacks on uh, uh, basically the. The, the family unit and like how society used to be. So it's really inspiring to see like three brothers, like all in this uh, together. And you seem to all get along really well. I'm not sure if there's sort of, you know, many sort of big sibling fights when you were growing up. I, I appreciate that. Um, it is, it is a lot of fun to, to do it with them. There was always a lot of uh, sibling fights, a lot of, well, cause there's kind of one and a half years between my older brother and myself, and then three years between me and my little brother. So there was always jockeying for the, uh, who was the alpha male between um, my, my older brother and myself in the house. Um, but even, uh, no, but, but, but in terms of, of doing this, I mean, you can get on each other's nerves a little bit because you know how to kind of push each other's buttons, but overall it's good. And I think, um, I think basically we produce our best stuff when it's all three of us together, um, with, you know, with a mic of our own, than than any two of us or, or kind of one of us. And, and it's, it's, that's when we, that's where, yeah, I think that, that, that's when we have the most fun as well. Cause at, at the end of the day as well, like this is still, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's fun. I mean, the editing and, and, stuff can be laborious but it's uh i wouldn't do it if i if i didn't enjoy it and having uh having them definitely makes it more fun yeah uh, uh, that's as i said like you know you're great working together and yeah obviously i've said i enjoy your your podcast well, that's very, i appreciate that uh, we missed last week and i'm gonna make sure to do one tonight I, one of the problems is it's uh oh anyway i won't i won't bore you with with the details but um we uh we do love a good podcast and we'll be making one tonight i think Release I've for been, tomorrow morning yeah i think i've been your biggest slave driver saying when is i expected to be out on monday morning don't yeah. make well don't, look i appreciate that don't make me listen to like a abc news podcast oh mate i wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy mm. yeah that that that's the threat that i'm yeah okay. unleashing well, yeah, no, I appreciate that. I mean, it can be, um, you, you know how it is. I mean, it can be hard to make yourself go and put the mic on the stand and plug it into a computer and do some research and, and start talking. But it's um, it's fun when you get into it. And then, um, but keeping, I'm like not naturally a disciplined person at all. And it's something I've really been trying to work on in different aspects of my life is like showing up each each week and, and, and being committed. Um, and, uh, and it's, it's a skill I'm still learning. 
Well, it's obviously being like, because it's a form of entrepreneurship. You've got to be, if you want something to happen, you've got to make it happen. You've got to be disciplined. Mm. Yeah. And, um, yeah, you, you got, you got to be disciplined and, and yeah, the other thing is like, one thing I've, I've started to realize as well is that, um, these things, you don't, it's, you don't usually get good at things quickly. It usually takes quite a while for you to actually get, get good at something. I mean, no, uh, and I mean, although this kind of alternative media scene is, is, is very new, um, it's like you growing slowly is something I'm, I'm more and more kind of comfortable with. Like, I don't, I don't even want to. Like I have no real desire to be like a, a famous or like a rock star or something. If I get, if if this thing works out as a byproduct of like enjoying ourselves and learning, then then kind of, and, and having fun, then that's awesome. But um, it's uh, you know, it probably won't. If it does go really well, it won't happen for a few years. And um, that's that's just kind of the game we're in, and we're just trying to get at it, um, and and kind of have fun. Now, as I mentioned, uh, you and your brothers, you're very, you, you approach everything with skepticism, open inquiry, and I think that a lot of Gen Z are like that today because they've been raised on the internet. They've, if they've wanted to know the truth about something, they've been able to look it up for themselves. Obviously, the expression back in the day was uh, Google it, but I don't think you should do that anymore. But... Mm -hmm. Basically, before we saw the, the big tech uh, social media giants basically change their algorithms and try to hide what we were, uh, what they don't want us to, to see, you, you basically had a, the world at your fingertips. You could find out, obviously, about Epstein's crimes. And it really came into fruition in the, the 2016 US presidential election where... Like, if, if this was just a mainstream media election back in, say, 2008, Hillary Clinton would have won. Uh, but because over the past 20 years in the United States, there'd been an alt-media boom. There's websites like Town Hall, uh, obviously Breitbart, uh, Daily Caller, World Net Daily. Uh, the list uh, goes on. I can probably think of a few more. But obviously Infowars as well. How could I, how could I leave that out? and Rebel Media also launched. And so, but they're, obviously the, the mainstream media, they were covering for, for Hillary Clinton, trying to suppress the WikiLeaks uh, emails and all of the dodgy stuff that was going on in the Clinton. Quick shout out to our boy Julian Assange. Quick shout out to him. Yes, I know that you're, you and your brothers are big advocates of, of free Assange. And I think we'd all like that uh, Trump or he's got the deep state around him who basically want to hang him. And so we don't know sort of what, if Trump's you know, got a 40 chess move to protect Assange. Yeah. Well, can I tell you what? I hope so. Um, but, uh, at the end of the day, he's, uh, he's standing up for what he believes in. He's got a few, he's got a few Australian supporters out here. He's got, um, anyway, and what also came in, back into to promise during 2016 was what's turned the Clinton body count because over it, it's been documented over the years by various people the the people in uh, the the Clinton families in the circles who uh, who've fallen out or had information who've mysteriously died so it's either a, a suicide the most infamous one two bullets to the back of the head uh, a heart attack uh, and. Well, there's also plane crashes as well. Plane crashes. What happened to Seth Rich? Yes, yeah, Seth Rich. It was the death of Seth Rich that really put it back into the the uh, the people's minds when you even had people like Sean Hannity talking about it. And Seth Rich is he's suspected of the one who gave the emails to to Julian Assange, and he was walking back in Washington D.C. late at night was was shot dead, and the police said it was a robbery gone wrong, even though. Uh, nothing was taken uh, from yeah. him, and that was th that was the end of it. And it's sort of the same as the as soon as the medical examiner said Epstein committed suicide, it was basically like case closed. With the police in Zeth Rich case, they said it was robbery gone wrong. We didn't catch the people, but case closed. Yeah, no, it's it's so strange. And who's the um? What's the uh? Well, who's the, the big Democrat donor who just got done because he kept having these black guys around and overdosed them on heroin? What's that guy's name? I haven't heard of that. I'd have to well, invest. Okay, well, there's uh, 
it was it was actually a front page CNN story, which is why I was so surprised. Um, there's he, he's like a, a mega donor, and he do you remember he's like he had uh, like two people die in his house over like uh, in the space of a year because he had this sexual fetish of feeding them drugs, and uh, it's like straight out of Alex Jones. And then finally, there's this one guy who was like getting overdosed. This happened in like the past couple of weeks and I'm probably getting some of the details wrong. But anyway, he escaped and the neighbors called the police and he's like, yeah, this guy tried to kill me. I wish I remember his name, but it's probably out of the news cycle within like an hour. It's just like, yeah. Uh, Hence why shocking. it's it's gone over my head. See, we're, yeah. we're alert people, yeah. but there's still stuff that we miss because mm. I just saw on TA.news uh, just yesterday, uh, that's uh, Tommy Robinson News, uh, Arby Yemeni writes uh, a lot of the, the content that there was an Islamic terror attack in New Zealand earlier this month uh, that wasn't reported at all. Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, that's that's what Tommy went to jail for, was the, with the grooming gangs, which didn't go reported for like two years. And then he's the one who reports on them, and then he gets thrown into jail. Because he's not an accredited journalist. Uh, he's, he's not with a, a newspaper or a trusted... He hasn't got, well, in Australia, it's the MEAA uh, media accreditation card. Can I tell you, if probably if you have that card, it means people should listen to whoever else is not you. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. That's basically... If you've got that like... card, I reckon that means that you get disqualified from... Uh... No, 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 no. It's, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's... The, the Tommy Robinson thing, it's like the amount of police resources and government resources which went into putting this guy in jail within like the same day of his contempt of court thing, when it took like two years before they even took notice of these grooming gangs which, which were happening, um, and Tommy was the only person reporting it, it's just shocking. Yeah, and the, the government has been, because his profiles increased so much over, over many years, and at the beginning of this year they took him off uh, Facebook, YouTube, and th this is what we think, because, like, Tommy Robinson was around when I was uh, in my uh, early 20s, and mm. he was interviewed by the mainstream media, it's, and it was the same with Alex Jones, when I mean, he was on the radio, on the, the FCC-controlled radio ways, and it seemed that people like Tommy and, and Alex... Like the the globalists and the the people in power thought, well, they're just cranks. Like nobody's nobody's going to listen to them. You know, giving them some attention it might be good for our ratings, but pff, you know, who's going who's going to listen to them? And then, of course, they've been like, oh shit, there's Brexit. Oh shit, there's uh, Donald Trump's become president. Oh shit, there's mm. all of these nationalists being elected all over the world. And all of a sudden, Alex Jones being on the air for, for 20 years gets deplatformed in 24 hours from everything and mm. tommy robinson it was more of a slower uh, process but they they, mm. they got him in the end yeah well i mean he's um i thought his documentary the hashtag pano drama was fantastic did you get to watch that i watched prob probably about a sort of five minute summary of it right well yeah i thought it was i thought it was great and it it the like the B it, it went inside like the BBC. It had them like paying people for, to make up different stories and then uh, trying to smear Tommy. And it was um, it was I don't know. Well, like it's it's one of those things where you say like you don't know why they dislike him so much, but you do know. You just and it's just uncomfortable to talk about um, the how deep some of those cultural issues go. Um, it's also now uh, the reason why there's this get Tommy, get Alex Jones. It, mm. it, it's because obviously we've seen since around 2015, the, the radical left, they've really got more power. I mean, they'd been operating like in the universities and in the media for a number of years, but they really began to take control in 2015, 2016. And so now, like, obviously we're seeing the deplatforming movement and I, we've seen it with uh, Alan Jones in Australia trying to get him yeah. uh, uh, ta ta taken off the air. And I've noticed this, uh, like, in Australia with people like Blair Cottrell, if, like, a, a journalist doesn't call, like, him a, a Nazi criminal, then they'll get, you know, uh, 50... Uh, tweets in their reply saying like you know how can you not say that you know he's literally hitler it's 
it's the it's the same with any sort of like nationalist figure like if a, if a mainstream media journalist if they write something which is fair then they'll get all these pile on and mm. they'll be like oh no i'm mm. uh, people are not liking my work sure but can i tell you i think um well this is one of the really interesting things is that the you say well what what type of power is left in the mainstream media like why are people still engaged in mainstream media considering it's it's probably not the best content um it's not even the most widely consumed content at all but what's left i think is status right if you're the new york times you have a you have a big brand name bigger than than any other brand name if you work for the new york times you have um you know much more social credit uh than you do if you work at like Infowars or or breitbart or or something right you you just kind of have the name but they don't really have anything else um i mean joe rogan gets 150 million podcast downloads a month um, he's the most powerful media organization in the world, him and his, you know, Eddie Bravo and Alex Jones and, and whoever else in the studio. And um, I think that as much as the we can see the status in front of us of these mainstream media or news organizations saying this is what's going on and they kind of getting more and more uh, kind of polarizing and extreme as, as they fall, I actually think that... Uh, Kind of the majority of people are looking to people uh, are looking to guys like Joe Rogan or whoever else who you might not even agree with based on on his different policy um, ideas, but you like his commitment to like kind of free speech and and democracy and listening to what people have to say and not trying to win a conversation by hurling character insults at somebody else. I mean, um, I actually think there is. Uh, I'm I'm a lot more optimistic about about the future, but I think that a lot of the problems with the mainstream media is that it's just it's losing. The mainstream media is losing, and there's nothing they can do to stop the bleeding. And so, as a result, they're getting more and more chaotic and more and more extreme. You mentioned Joe Rogan. I'm actually not a not a big fan. I don't like this intellectual dark web, as it's called, mm -hmm. a a push because to me it's still. Uh, these people, they 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 still have a a web of a circle of allowable opinion. There's there's certain people or groups that uh, they will they will basically disavow, throw under the bus, basically deplatform as well. I can consider Joe Rogan, uh, mm. Dave Rubin, Jordan Peterson, uh, yeah. Quillette. Uh, you had to look at the way that sort of Andy No, you know, mysteriously left uh, Quillette after his. Uh, after he was seen getting along too well with the uh, the proud boys uh mm. sort of he was he, he was sort of seen as you know being being too on the on, on the street being into the rough and tumble and this is sort of what i don't like about them as well is that they're not on the streets they're all you know behind their keyboards just in their their comfy studios where what's going on at the moment with antifa for example take well they've taken over a city in portland in the United States, uh, in Sydney, like Newtown, there's pretty much Antifa HQ. Like you, you're mm. not you're not really going to by writing like a a thousand uh, word essay on the flaws of third wave feminism. That's not going to defeat Antifa. No, I fully understand. Uh, I fully get where you're coming from, and I I agree with you in in a lot of ways. I mean, I think um, I think when Milo, like one of the, I think Milo made a lot of good contributions. I think one of, but I think one of his issues I, when I read the book, I mean, he said um, a lot of people uh, kind of hate me and they think I'm I'm kind of un an untouchable cultural or political figure because I'm toxic. But actually, they should, if they listen to my opinions, they would actually kind of hear the reason. But at the same time, I'm not like those kind of Richard Spencer alt right types. They they're terrible and disgusting, and I distance myself from them. And it's like he's actually doing the same thing as the mainstream media. He's just doing it to somebody else, or he's extending the the bar further along. Um, but uh, and and you know you're right in the sense that you do see um, some forms of restriction of what you're allowed to talk about on that intellectual dark web. Um, all I would say is that it's it's absolutely in its infancy, and. Um, the the idea that you don't have mainstream media you don't need to rely on the mainstream media to get your news and your kind of discussions and to see where the cultural debate is at is is kind of a new idea and a, a new behavior and i think it will continue to grow and develop um it's the issues you can't talk about on the intellectual dark web uh 
Well, maybe we'll, maybe we'll get into them, maybe we won't, but I think there's... Uh, I think the intellectual dark web, all I'm trying to say is I think it covers the uh, majority opinion. I think that where people, the majority, like kind of the majority people don't see their opinions expressed in the mainstream political landscape, but they might see it in, in alternative media. I think that's a really good step forward, even if it doesn't, even if that uh, kind of intellectual dark web or alternative media doesn't cover everyone yet, at least. It seems to me that it's basically like right-wing elites that's we don't like the elites on the the left and who are currently in power but uh, where the uh, we're basically we just want to replace the the elites who are in power at the moment where i think the oh, people I fully who disagree with that why why do you say that oh well they have a lot of different people on i mean <clears throat> joe rogan is not left-wing at all i mean sam harris is not left-wing the weinstein brothers i think would describe themselves as socialists and they're people who come on uh, joe rogan's platform quite a lot. I mean, Sam Harris uh, said, you know, he would have voted for Clinton. I mean, these aren't just people who are dissatisfied with the deep state. They're people with, I think, all range of different types of opinions. They don't even sometimes related to politics, but you have like a uh, very, very um, kind of outspoken Clinton supporters. I probably shouldn't have got into that trap of just using the general term right wing. Uh, because yes, as you mentioned, people like Sam Harris, he's even though he's and uh, Glenn Greenwald, uh, like he's he's left wing as well, but certainly uh, anti-establishment. But the overall point mm. that I'm making is that elites fighting with each other, intellectuals fighting with each other, with each other that's still basically the the one percenters uh, basically fighting over which direction we're going to take the world where it's it's basically the the people who are, are the ones who are like, living day to day like seeing the news are the are the working class people the the people who are left behind and they're the ones who actually go out on on real streets and the reason why i think that i i don't want to use the word street battle but basically like reclaiming the streets whether it be from communists or criminal gangs or any other type of disruptive people i think that that's that that ground level that's where things really need to change because like like i said a lot of a lot of these people part of the intellectual dark web they're still privileged people and the the people who are affected by sort of these ideas they're debating they're sort of sidelined because they, they might have some fringe or un unspeakable views uh, but they're part of society mm. well why do you think that uh the streets is the most important place for political change because that's how the left is able to affect political change like the climate strikes on friday there, mm. it, it, it was ba basically it was well attended like you saw the the, the mm -hmm. streets full that's those are the sort of things that makes the real decision makers governments quake that's what makes the media it impossible to ignore you. I mean, revolutions like I know that uh, they say that the the pen is mightier than the sword. I mean, how did they they break down the Berlin Wall in uh, East Germany? How did they get rid of Chavzeski in Romania? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, look, I'm I'm sympathetic with that, and I think that uh, protests a lot of the time can can be very influential but i think the the idea that uh like a, a joe rogan with uh, alex jones video which talks a, about uh, an unearthing a lot of stuff on the deep state that i mean that might be the most powerful content in the uh, you know political civilian made political content there is available um i would also say that I, like there's definitely maybe what you would call elites on the intellectual dark web. But I think Joe Rogan in particular is, is not kind of elite at all. I mean, grew up poor, he's an MMA commentator. Um, but like, I don't think, well, do you, it, it is interesting. The, is the streets a really important kind of sphere of, of politics? I, I don't know, I haven't really thought about it, to be honest. Well, I'm, it, it I'm speaking be. of the streets in terms of the people who occupy the actual streets, which is- All right. The, oh, well, all, Sorry, all I was going to say as well um, is that at the end of the day, the most important uh, thing for government, right, is is kind of at the 
at, at the ballot box, right? And that's what that's what Donald Trump understood. That's I guess what what Scott Morrison understood. Um, and uh, you know the the not my president protests are, are very much um, you know that that they went on for a, a long time, and they would be some of the most influential maybe protests or marches that that America would have seen in 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 a while. But also like. Trump's base uh, and middle America don't, I don't think actually care that much. They'd be like, well, he is the president and we're just going to see if he does a good job. Um, but I don't know. I definitely, because somebody said in the comments, I think Tim is underestimating the influence of the internet versus the street. And I'll, I'll address that because the, what I'm talking about the intellectual dark web is, and James Fox Higgins says, probably summarize it well, conversations about conversations about conversations. What I think that the the internet, the, the web, or whatever you call it, dark web, should be, and this is why I've titled the, the episode Modern Info Wars, because even though Alex Jones, like, he has the name of this website, that is, that, that is what the, the internet is these days. It's an information war. And obviously, if, if you're just going just going to sort of like sit around with like people who agree with you on like the intellectual dark web that's not really like what i see my role as the the unshackled is like because the mainstream media like i've noticed is lying it's uh, omitting facts it's basically uh trying to put it's using its old power to basically try and prevent people from waking up and this is why i connected to the street because the if people uh, do see like what is really going on with people like Epstein, uh, with uh, deep state elites and things, how mass immigration is being forced upon us, things like that, then it obviously filters down to way more of the, the mass population. And that's why Facebook and Google have been uh, so eager to crack down on fake news, manipulate the algorithm, uh, uh, try and hide channels such as such as yours, yours and mine's, because the info war, it, it if that filters down, if we win the the information war, then that's that's really what's going to make the elites really uh, scared and governments really scared. Mm -hmm. Well. <clears throat> Firstly, I, I understand your your page is, has been suffering censorship. I don't think mine is popular enough yet. So maybe one day we will, if uh, all things go well. Um, but I think the um, that's one of the things I really like the internet. I'm really I'm really actually kind of excited for the future. I'm a lot more optimistic than I know like Dia is, for instance, about kind of the future of of our culture and countries and stuff. And I think internet is going to play a, a massive part in it. And I think a part for good. Uh, I hope, just because I think on an individual level, most people are open to uh, information that kind of helps solve problems. And as much as the mainstream media can can try and uh, distort it in some type of ways and promote narratives, and and even sometimes alternative media can promote narratives and distort the truth and and clicks and uh, whatever. I think that um, I don't think the people I don't think people have changed that much. I think people have. Um, uh, naturally attracted to the truth, are naturally attracted to problem solving, are genuinely attracted to authenticity, which is why people like have left the kind of the mainstream media. And I think that um, as long as people kind of individually try to, what would I say? As long as everyone is kind of that thought didn't quite I haven't quite articulated the thought yet. It's still developing. But all I would say is that. Um, I think there is. Uh, I, I think the information, the information war, or the, or the war f for truth, I think will be won. And I'm, uh, I, yeah, I don't, I don't see how it couldn't. And obviously, the mainstream media, one of their their weapons in trying to take down the the old media is saying they promote uh, fake news. And there was a real sh uh, sh shocking example of fake news on on our side this weekend with the the climate. Uh, uh, protest. This was spread by a Facebook page called the Australian Youth Coal Coalition. It I said, look at the that. mess at today's climate protest left behind in beautiful uh, Hyde Park. And that was actually from Hyde Park in, in London uh, back in in April. Apparently it was a 420 uh, rally. And right. so it was, it was a Hyde Park on the other side of the world. 
basic, oh, basically. Really? And so all the uh, like leftists on social media have been saying, you know, this is why we need Facebook and all the responsible people to crack down on the fake news. And but I will pref. My response to this is like because I saw this photo and I was immediately skeptical of it because uh, if I see something like that, if it looks too good to be true. It probably is. And I think the main people who fall for fake news are not people like us. They're, they're probably people like the boomers who they grew up with just the, the mainstream media and trusting it. Like they, they, like they, they no longer trusted their government, but they, they believed that the media, they were always the, the guardians of democracy. And so they haven't adjusted to this online change where and that's also why boomers, they fall for things like uh, online scams and the ATO calling where us like young people and that, we'd never fall for that. Like I get scam emails all the time and phone calls and I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah good one. And yeah. so I definitely think people, young people like us, because we're naturally skeptical, like we might see a photo like that and think, oh yeah, that, you know, you know, oh, I wish that was true, but mm. I don't trust that. Yeah, no, that's, you're exactly right. And it, the only other thing I would say on the on the media on the media point is that there's a temptation to but I think to to see the faults in the mainstream media and then say oh, okay therefore the alternative media is is like a hundred percent good and it's also not the case because the alternative media can also fall underneath like narratives that can promote stuff like that I mean one of my disappointments with the with some of right wing alternative media. Uh, has been I felt like some um, unwarranted and uh, like and uh, unhelpful attacks on like Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. I feel like a lot of the coverage that she's gotten hasn't actually been like related to a policy. It's been it's been stuff like oh she's a dumb waitress or some something like that. Or I've yeah, seen articles yeah. like that, and I I really don't like that at all either. And yeah. as much as I'm hesitant to defend her, I'll I'll like. You know, I don't want to be like a white knight or something, but I think that the just because there's a problem in the mainstream media doesn't like I, I just think there's like a, there should still be a, a, some attempt at journalistic like integrity and and at least trying to be everything the mainstream media is not not just be an equally poor alternative. I know what you're referring to there, and that is personal attacks. So like obviously, yeah. it. Like we should be talking about ideas and facts and actual information. And like I see this all the on the time with like the like Antifa enemies of the unshackled, they just resort to lame personal attacks, which mm. is, like it's it's pathetic. And you don't want the right to be like that as well. And like in terms of uh, like AOC being like a waitress, uh, Steve Bannon sa said it best, saying, "I don't attack her because of that, because she has a lived experience of uh, being a working class person." And Steve Bannon mm. says, "You know, we need more waitresses and factory workers in Congress, less lawyers and, and bankers." And so, somebody mm. like him, uh, a strategist, uh, recognizes that. And also, uh, there, there's also the video of her dancing during a college dance. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I. Uh, yeah, we've all like, you know, uh, done some dance moves. Oh, look can I tell silly. you? There's gonna be um, <laughs> I might as well, There's gonna be some terrible photos of me. If I no, I'm not saying I ever. Uh, if if I get to uh, there's look, all I'm saying is there's terrible photos of me. Possibly incriminating, but terrible. Yeah, you did. Uh, possibly some of them were were taken on those incidents you described off air to me. Uh, could be, could well be, and potentially some, anyway, we'll see if they come out. Now, obviously I've, t I've talked about that, the, uh, the need to get out onto the street and not just be on the keyboard in front of the camera. And you've actually done that recently. You and your younger brother, Andy, you went to the, the socialism conference in Sydney, uh, recently. Uh, you did a vlog from there. You went there with an open mind, wanting to learn, like, why do these people believe what they believe? I'll just play the the, the teaser from the from, uh, from from your vlog, and that's how it it's how it ended. Um, out by the thought police.
Well, it's Big Dukes and Big Andy checking in here at Sydney University. We've got the Sydney Socialism Conference on today and these two privileged straight white males are going to go and check it out. Are you excited, Andos? I'm excited. We're heading into hostile territory, so it's going to be a fun day, I reckon. I'm hoping we can actually learn something. My goal is we're going to go in, listen, maybe ask a couple questions, meet a few people there, be challenged intellectually, and um, I'm actually coming in with quite good intentions. Yeah, let's make, make some friends, I reckon. We'll make some, some friends. friends. We'll, uh, we're going to make the world a better place today. Anyway, we're going to bring you along for the ride, so let us know what you think. If you like this type of content, go ahead and smash <laughs> that like button. Welcome here. Everyone else's opinion and try to make the best judgment we can and saying that we have all the right answers such that all the other answers need to be dealt with violently uh, is very very dangerous and one that uh, one that I don't support uh, we're being escorted out of the venue um, we haven't done anything but we're allegedly right-wing activists so we're getting the old escort courtesy of the uh, of the socialist um, event. Anything wrong? What have we done wrong? Anything? I don't know, but we're pretty pathetic. We haven't even asked a question. We're getting escorted out by the thought police. So uh, Dugs and I just got kicked out of the uh, Socialism Sydney conference. Let's take off your hat. Yeah. Are we going? Wave yeah? check. Wave check. <laughs> Do I look better with the hat off? Yeah, you look sweet. No, are we rolling? Yeah. So Dugs and I just got kicked out of the uh, University of Sydney Socialist Conference, whatever it was, because we're uh, right-wing activists. It's come to their attention. Um, so obviously. Uh, it's a little bit disappointing that we can't, we, we didn't even ask a question, talk to anyone in a rude way. We had a couple of like interesting conversations with people where we... Yeah, so I'm sure you've seen like videos of people like RV Yemeni and, and Neil Erickson where uh, uh, they, they go to sort of these type of lefty events with the, and like there, there's always this like uh, shit show, which is, which is fun to watch because like these these leftists they're never going to answer like questions from people like Avi or Neil but you approached this you came with an open mind you wanted to learn you wanted to ask questions but you still got kicked out for as uh, Andy said being suspected right-wing activists so I think this was probably like the best video of like right-wing people going to such an event because you went there with an open mind like wanting to like have a conversation but these people they're they're basically they're they're a closed shop that it's not it's like they don't want to convince people they don't want to defend their arguments it's almost like basically they just want to like use a gun and that's how they're gonna deliver their their socialist revolution yeah man it was it was pretty weird like we <laughs> I guess people kind of thought it, we might have been a bit suspicious when we like brought a Camry in or something. Um, but like we walked down the stairs and like went to the like uh, where you, wherever you sign in, and um, we just got like heaps of different people come up to us like, so um, are you a are you a socialist? And you're like, oh, not really, man. But I'm I, I'm here to listen, like ask a few questions, see what see what people think, and they're like, oh, so um. Which which workshop which which session are you going to? I think, uh, and I was like, oh, the the rise of Nazis or the rise of the alt right or whichever. And like, oh yeah, the rise of the alt right in Australia. It's uh, it's really dangerous. Like, you see the these Nazi protests in Melbourne and like Pauline Hanson in the Parliament, like promoting all this like white supremacy. It's like, oh, so tell me about Pauline Hanson's white supremacy, <laughs> and um, like, oh, it's uh, the, her motion. It's okay to be white was like white supremacist. And it was like, and then I had a kind of a, a discussion there. And then that, I think that's the reason which um, kind of alerted different people in the in the conference. Because then I went to the session, I went to a session on Hong Kong protest. I wanted to ask the question because they were supporting the Hong Kong protesters. They're protesting the, the socialist government and it's a socialism conference that we're at. I thought that was, uh, I wanted to ask them how they justify that. And I, my hand up the whole, I was like the only person 
for, for parts of it, I was like the only person with my hand up and I had my hand up like the whole time. You're supposed to have your hand up when you want to ask a question. And they just would, wouldn't choose me. They wouldn't choose me on the alt-right thing. And then like we went outside and filmed our reactions to different segments, but we never, we didn't film anything when we were inside. We, we didn't even get to ask any questions. We didn't say anything. Um, except to different people outside the sessions when we just had a casual chat. And then um, we were just sitting down having lunch and this, 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 I was disappointed in my fellow gingers, this six, seven man bun guy, who was also a ginger. He, I had a man bun too that day, so we are having a man bun competition. And he said, look, we've been, uh, we've been uh, alerted that you guys are right-wing activists and are gonna have to ask you to leave. And it's like, if it's your event, you can kick me out if you like, but it's, it's, it doesn't sound good when you're not even willing to have a discussion about your arguments. Because I'm not even saying that you're wrong. I'm saying I have my opinions and I want to listen to yours and you're telling me I'm a right-wing activist. It's like, it's, it's much worse for you than it is for me. One, because I get to make a clickbait YouTube video. And number two, I didn't have a number two. Mainly it's, uh, oh, oh, number two is that you don't, uh, it doesn't seem like you're willing to defend any of your ideas. It sounds like the, uh, the organizers of that event, they'd make great members of the, the Stasi in East Germany at, at picking out who are the suspected dissidents. Yeah, we would, we, we, we would be pretty obvious. I mean, we had some, um, we were the straight white males with, uh, that automatically puts you on the list, I think. Well, what was the racial makeup of it? Like, because... What was it? It was, I think it was predominant. Oh, we got in trouble from, and yeah, I would say it's mainly white, but a mix. There was diff, definitely different, different, um, there's mix there. I'd say that the, the mix at the socialism conference, it would probably be the same, or uh, if not, uh, more white than what was at the CPAC Australia conference. Remember that far right, uh, conference that needed to be shut down. I, Mate, I, I would would not doubt it would not doubt it now you don't like uh political labels but you generally are, you refer to yourself as a libertarian i do as well uh, which leads me to the question uh have you got have you got your approved uh libertarian card by the libertarian purists are you a real libertarian no i wouldn't be a, a real libertarian uh at all I mean, I, I'm, I lean libertarian on almost everything. I like the idea of people being responsible for themselves. I like the idea of the individual being the right level of social analysis. I like the idea of smaller governments and, and letting markets do what they do best uh, in, you know, in, where they can. Um, but at the same time, I have like, uh, healthcare is, is a weird thing for me because it's very hard to work and be responsible for yourself if you're sick. Like that just seems intuitively true to me. And maybe there's um, a, a place for a kind of socialized healthcare. Now, the libertarians would say that the government would be the worst administrator of that. If Taxation possible, but, is theft. But um, yeah, and it's kind of like it goes down right to this fundamental level of individual rights and where do rights come from and metaphysics and stuff, which I've kind of had a little read of, but I, I'm not that good at it. And, um, but I think part of say I don't really like ideologues that much either. Like. I think pretending you have all the answers because you have like this really nice ideology, I think is unlikely to be true. But yeah, I'm kind of libertarian and I would not get my, I wouldn't get a libertarian card if I was, uh, you know, by, by any real libertarians. It's a joke that I make that libertarians are supposed to be against occupational licensing, yet they sort of want to have right. like a, a libertarian accreditation program because you have yeah. to be a, a real uh, libertarian it's, a, it's mm. always been ironic to me but it's weird like are you like a, an ayn rand libertarian or like a milton friedman libertarian or I'm like probably a, 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 a hayek or a, like what a mises libertarian like they're there's they're, they're sort of termed the sort of mises uh caucus of the libertarian movement so Peter, like it's named after ludwig von mises but it uh it's most prominent member is probably murray rothbard the anarcho-capitalist who founded the ludwig von mises institute more modern uh people are uh, hans herman hopper uh, tom woods who's a libertarian podcaster lou rockwell that's probably where i i the mm -hmm. uh, libertarians who i believe that i have the most in common with and who i i get along with now 
<laughs> yeah, just like just like me, they're also accused of being secret uh, white supremacists, uh, enabling uh, hatred. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 so strange that libertarians get it's get get thrown in there. I mean, one of Donald Trump's main things has been his like deregulation agenda, and people still accuse him of being authoritarian. It's like he's trying to get less power. He's trying to have less power, at least in at least in like the economics of the thing. And I mean. Anyway, but I think, yeah, I think, um, well, to be fair, that's those names you listed, I'm about 0% familiarity with, with, with any of them, and that uh, they would definitely deny my libertarian card. The Mises people? Yeah. Oh, I, I reckon I'll... I'll, I'll send you some uh, some literature and 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 get you yeah. get you get into some contacts because yeah I th I think you cool. well because you and I get along I think uh, you and them could get along. All right, well, very cool. I'm excited. But I think probably the issue that libertarians uh, should be most concerned about is that of free speech because especially in the mm. in the digital age we've talked about google and facebook and you know we've seen our own prime minister scott morrison new zealand's jacinda ardern wanting uh more crackdown on extremist uh, content online mm. whatever that word means mm. and we've also we've seen pushes for increased hate speech laws america is it's quite protected with its first amendment but we are seeing it eroded everywhere and I, and this is the thing that the the left have basically they've been able to say if you support free speech you support enabling uh, Nazis. That's that's what they say. Yeah. That free speech is a gateway to uh, Nazism, which is is quite absurd because I've never known a a free speech society to lead to totalitarianism. I mean, the United States has had free speech protected for a uh, 100 uh, 250 years and yeah there's been yeah no it does there does seem to be a very strong correlation with totalitarianism and uh, a whole lot of schools of thought being illegal i think those two go pretty close together i mean the uh, i think it was 1936 i want to say it was the burning of the books in germany i mean it was it's like you anyway it's 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 you're right it's absolutely silly it's absolutely silly um and as, as well like I, I don't know people would be able to tell me about this and and the idea of like how much how right-wing is libertarianism like i don't really know um but at the end of the day it's like libertarians and i think conservatives get uh are kind of very much natural allies today particularly behind the free free speech thing where it wouldn't have happened like 20 years ago like 20 years ago it was the religious right who was who was trying to like ban violent video games who was trying to um like ban the simpsons it was like on we're on that we're, we're flipped it we're flipped yeah it. i remember uh, I, uh when i was a teenager that there was a moral panic in the united states because janet jackson's nipple was broadcast on on live tv that was going to traumatize uh, a whole generation and we basically needed the the fcc uh the uh, uh, the TV watchdog in the United States to basically censor television to, you know, bad words. Oh, it, mm. Even if you saw somebody's, like, crack on, like, live yeah. TV, that was, you know, it was going to scar us. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's... it's yeah. All I would say is that the... Um, I love saying that, all I would say. That's been my catchphrase for the uh, for the podcast. But... Um, the the, liberty, the the free speech issue I don't think is is necessarily a, a partisan one I think it's like a or like a principled one I think it just should be free speech regardless of kind of the political climate you're in and it's it's kind of jumped from the from the left wing issue, as from a left wing issue to a right wing issue and I think that's that's one of the reasons why the free speech people get lumped in with the like right wing people or, or, or yeah I don't, it's weird to me it's weird to me and I would also add to that it's because I'm planning to write at some stage an essay on this, how basically the uh, the the modern left uh, that they, they've basically fallen into the the trap of loving big like big brother government. Because back in my day, like they were the ones who were against they were you know, cool. the, 
Yeah, they were they were against the Iraq War abuses of power, but now they're basically the anti for people. It's like we want the CIA and the FBI to basically monitor the internet to crack down on these far right yeah. extremists. We need these uh, lists of of people who are potentially uh, extreme. We need things such as you know preventative detention to yeah. you know I mean, lock that best... lock those people away. The best pre uh, mainstream media press coverage Trump got is when he bombed the Syrian air bases. Mm. It's um, it's it's so strange. Mm. Yes, well, that's why I say that I haven't changed. I've I've always been the same. It's just that the supporters of free speech and the enemies of free speech have basically reversed. Yes, sounds a lot like um, a lot like Mark Latham. <laughs> uh, oh, you're interviewing him, aren't you? Uh, yeah, I am this week, but his, yeah. his thing has always been that like my, you know, when 20 years ago I was the head of labor, um, or however long ago it was, um, but I still believe basically the same things, but the, the cultural landscape changed. I hope you ask him about, because he, he kind of lost me earlier this year, Mark Latham, when he said the solution to drugs at music festivals was uh, more sniffer dogs and more police. Oh, more dogs. <laughs> so, Ugh. yeah. If you're going to do a good job, you've got to grill him on that. Okay, well, 100% I will. I want to ask him about marijuana legalization. I should ask him if he's ever done a drug. Oh, uh, well, think, uh, if, you've, if you've read the Latham Diaries, uh, uh, his post, um, he actually wrote, wrote about when he was first a, a junior MP in the 1994, that apparently the, the MPs were like passing around a joint in Parliament House and he had a, a whiff on the, on the joint. And so he was basically saying there was... I think this is why they probably don't want to be drug tested, the politicians, because... Ooh. Oh, can I tell you, those, a lot of, so many, there'll be so many politicians who love drugs. Yeah. there would be so many. I mean, um, like, I think this is what my little brother was, this, my little brother was telling me, he reckons that there was a study done and um, it was like a sewerage study. It was like, which suburbs in Sydney are the like biggest drug users and it was the richer suburbs yeah. it was the, i mean it was different types of drugs but it was the richer suburbs i mean you go to I reckon the amount of bankers who would be on who, who would love cocaine recreationally but also would be on cocaine working or to just to get a deal done because they're in the print room trying to trying to finish a deal would be w way higher than anyone's happy to admit i mean i even had um i one of my friends who's who's a pharmacist and you know how you know how like a pharmacy there's like a uh, there's a rule. It might even just be New South Wales. I don't know. But basically, it's to help heroin uh, users so they can come in and swap their syringes for free for a set of new syringes. And it's basically like a hygiene thing, so it doesn't spread with whichever diseases. And she's like, you would be surprised at the amount of like high performing like uh, white collar people who come in and swap their needles. Like it is, it's much more than you think it is. If you want a real crackdown on uh, drug use, I suggest get the sniffer dogs and the police to the, the Melbourne Cup. Uh, but I think you might catch uh, too many, uh, maybe bankers and lawyers yeah. and, and socialites and high profile celebrities at the Melbourne Cup. Yeah. Oh, can I tell you, there'd be that many drugs there. And I mean, let's not pretend we can stop the drugs. I mean, drugs are going to No, happen no. But it's, yeah, you, you get my point that. Oh, yeah. 100%. I think it's 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 silly. I mean, I think we there's like 70,000 arrests in a, from like marijuana every year in Australia. I just think it's so dumb. Such a waste of resources. And I mean, not being the fun police. I mean, marijuana doesn't kill anybody. Marijuana just makes Lord of the Rings more more funny when you watch it. I mean, why it's illegal is is an absolute mystery to me. Mm. And I know that on previous um uh podcast appearances you've said you know you're, you're a bit of well a bit of a, a party boy and you you talk about you and your brothers uh, being a being a boy band and there's that famous line in the one direction song tonight let's get some and live while we're young yes well look i uh, i can't say any self-incriminating uh, evidence except that i you know i'm i'm honest about my uh, my policy suggestions which is legalize Yes, and that's probably a good note to, to end on. So I think we've had a good chat tonight, uh, Dougal. I hope I haven't put you in sort of an uncomfortable position because everything I do now is live and it's it's on the record. So. Yeah, I've enjoyed it. I like actually going live, and I'm I'm thinking I'm much I'm pretty attracted to the live because it means you don't have to edit and upload as far as I can tell. Yeah, yeah, but, that's what I'm loving as well. That it just goes live and 
uh, it's it's there and yeah you get the live chat as well so it's been a pretty live chat tonight and as always the 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 live chat has been most triggered when we've talked about libertarianism and mm -hmm. uh, freedom well i'll have to go back and have a look at it because i haven't been able to to check it the whole time but i'm sure it would be some good some good comments mm. I, I, I love the people in my live chat, but I also do like to trigger them from, from time to time. We've sort of come to a sort of an understanding, me and my, my live chat, but they do like my shows, so I do appreciate it. Yeah, well, there's a reason they tune in, huh? Mm. All right, uh, we'll, we'll chat again soon, but thank you so much for coming on tonight and look forward to the wrap uh, tomorrow morning, hint, hint. And... Okay, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and make it happen. And yeah, can't wait for more of your interviews. And yeah, I get back on, out onto the street. Um, there's there's stuff happening in Sydney, so yeah, get out Thank there. You. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I'll uh, I'll try my best. I'll try my best. Take care. You too. Thanks for tuning in to Wilmsfront. Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting the unshackled.net to view all our shows and to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.